evening, and welcome to Grace Lutheran. It is very nice to have all of you with us here this evening. Uh, welcome especially to those of you who may be viewing us uh, on, they are viewing us online, right? Okay, those of you who may be viewing us online this evening, uh, or at some point in time later on, she had a look on her face like she was concerned that maybe that wasn't working right, so I apologize. Uh, great to have everybody with us tonight. Uh, all of our announcements are coming now via constant contact. Uh, we're also putting the upcoming week schedule for you uh, on the prayer page. So if you just took that home with you, uh, you'd be able to do that. We have those prayers for the states. We have the states that we're praying for uh, in the upcoming week on the prayer page as well, too. So you'll take that home. You'll have that. I do want you to be aware that this is the week of our pastors and educators conference over in Daytona Beach. So the church offices are going to be closed Monday through Wednesday uh, because all of us will be over there at that conference. And then as we're coming back, uh, all of the educators, all of our teachers and staff are going to be heading over there. So the school offices will be closed Wednesday through Friday. Church office opens back up again Thursday and Friday. Uh, so do keep that in mind if for some reason you have to reach out to us uh, or contact somebody. Monday, Tuesday, the school's school offices open, church office closed. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, school office closed. Thursday, Friday, church office is open. I did want to make us aware because I had a few questions about this already, and I never like prayers to be announcements. If for some reason you did not hear this, uh, one of our members, an 18-year-old member who's a senior in high school, Charlie Card, was the driver of the truck that was in that terrible accident uh, on 54th on uh, Thursday afternoon driving home from school. I am happy to say that he is doing very well. He's in the hospital. Uh, in fact, they were hoping uh, to move him to a regular room, even hopefully by now. I saw him earlier this evening. Uh, he was walking a little bit. Uh, so his recovery is coming along ahead of what would be hoped for. The expectation is that he'll have a full recovery Thanks be to God, because it was um, it was really a significant accident. So we will continue to keep Charlie uh, and his family in our prayer. All right, that is everything. At this time, I'll invite all of us to stand. All that we need will be on the screen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most so that we may delight in your law and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose strength is made perfect in weakness, grant us humility and childlike faith that we may please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost is from the book of Jeremiah, the 11th chapter. The Lord made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not know it was against me. They devised saying schemes and saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name will be remembered no more. But, O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tests the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is in the book of James, the third chapter. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in, in the meekness of wisdom. 
But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. It is not the wisdom that comes down from, from above, but the earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. A heart and a harvest um, of righteousness is sown in, in peace by those who make, make peace. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions uh, are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Do not do, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly, to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you... Do you not know that friendship within the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it, um, it is to no purpose that the scripture says he earns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says... God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. The disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee, and Jesus did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This is the gospel of the Lord.
I think there is a certain order to everyone's life. A daily, weekly, and yearly order for each of us. That makes sense since we are made in the image of the God who is a God of order. Even though that image is marred and mangled in our post-fall world, there's still a sense of order to our lives. And so, of course, the same holds true, and more so for the body of Christ, his church. Given the number of visitors that we are going to have here this weekend, it, it, it makes sense to me that we would spend a little bit of time talking about that. The way in which Christ's church is ordered for just a little bit. So, here goes. The church here begins on the weekend closest to St. Andrew Day. I don't expect you to remember when St. Andrew Day is. It's November the 30th. And that's when the season of Advent starts. Now, now, truth be told, most of us think that this is the Christmas season. So, sadly, while the church here is designed to forego a celebration of the Savior's birth until Christmas Day itself, and then the 12 days that follow, the world is fed up with Christmas by then. I commented to Laura as we were on our way in. She was making fun of me because I have nutcrackers on the front as a screensaver of my iPad, but they already have them in Sam's Club. Decorations for Christmas are up all over the place because they want you to spend money and will be fed up with Christmas by the 25th. Trust me. So if we don't move the celebration, some of it at least, forward, very few will hear the good news of Jesus' birth proclaimed. That's why we fudge that order a bit and take those opportunities that present themselves to talk about the Savior's birth throughout the month of December. The rest of that first half of the church year is shaped in form by the life of Jesus itself then. In fact, I have this really beautiful church year chart in my hand. Notice that Jesus, the Lamb of God, is there squarely in the center of it. We're going to be gifting these to our classrooms uh, along with a chart of the Ten Commandments in the upcoming weeks because that's a part of providing a Christ-centered, exceptional education, just what we promised in our school vision statement. So just like those rooms have an alphabet chart, probably a color wheel over in the art room, maps on the wall, periodic tables, and number lines, we're going to also have these reminders of the Christian faith hanging there. As a side benefit, this satisfies a requirement of our accreditation process that will come up shortly. At any rate, if you see here the bluish purple and white and gold on the top of the chart, that's the Advent Christmas season. And over to the side, the purple, black, gold, and white, that's Lent, Holy Week, and Easter. The goal of Jesus coming to die for the sins of the world is emphasized throughout those seasons of the church here. It's there for us to reflect upon and more importantly receive his blessings of forgiveness and life at all of the additional services that we offer at that time. You should check those out if you haven't before. And that, dear friends in Christ, 
gathered in Jesus' name this evening brings us to our gospel reading. Being an astute group, as I know that you are, I'm sure that you notice the gospel was divided into two very distinct and seemingly different sections. Here's how the first one went. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. For those who know their Bibles well, this section contains several of Mark's favorite themes. There's the messianic secret where no one is to talk about Jesus and what he was doing until after his resurrection. There's the fear rising and then calming as a reaction to the entering of the divine into the creation. And then there's the least being the greatest. Mark develops each one of these themes throughout. Here, he uses them as a transition into the second part of his entire gospel. Indeed, notice that they were passing through the northernmost region of Israel, Galilee. In the second portion of our reading, they have a brief stop over there in their home base in Capernaum before setting out on a final journey with Jesus to the cross, Jerusalem. That's what the second half of Mark focuses on. What will churchly order would have us think of Holy Week and Easter rather than the Pentecost season. The Pentecost season is all of that green that you see there. It's a time when we grow in God's word. Our readings in the upcoming week are going to make us feel as if we are back in Lent, moving towards Easter. Honestly, though, everything we do in the church and in our lives as Christians flow from the Lord Jesus, particularly from his death and resurrection for our sake and our salvation while we patiently await his second coming. And so, as he is headed towards the cross in our reading for today, teaching about its significance, and just as clearly, his disciples have yet to understand it. Indeed, like most students who stumble upon something they can't understand, they've shut down. So Jesus asked them, why, what were you discussing along the way? But they kept silent, for on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And there it is. The brokenness caused from sin. Know it or not, we are all broken because of sin. That's what these Ten Commandments reveal. In fact, they reveal that we are so broken that we've lost sight of the reality that in God's order of things, positions of leadership are meant for service. Not power, not riches, not wealth. Service. It's true. The eternal Son of God came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for the many. That's God's order of things. You see, from all eternity, the Father has loved the Son, the Holy Spirit being the bond of love between them. That's how St. Augustine, the great doctor of the Western Church, describes it. In time, that love was so great 
that the holy triune God created the heavens and the earth to share it with the people whom he created too as its crown jewel. Why were we created? To be loved by God in caring for this part of his creation, the earth, including each other who dwell herein. Now, along the way to Jerusalem, the disciples were beginning to realize the full extent to which they had messed things up. Sin messes things up. Remember, they witnessed Jesus' miracles. They had just caught a glimpse of his full glory in the transfiguration. No doubt they thought this was going to be easy, the world's redemption. Now he was telling them it would not be so. That it was going to take his own death to set things right. What a mess we've made. That the price for cleaning it up would be the death of God the Son on a cross. How could that be, they thought. How about you? H haven't you wondered that at times? Possibly? Probably? A and yet, through that wondering, so great is God's love for us that he did it. Died for our sake and our salvation, your sake and your salvation. If you only take one thing home tonight, let it be this, that were you the only person in the world, Jesus would have come to die for you. Pretty remarkable, don't you think? For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Listen to what comes next. He said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to him, to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. For nearly 70 years, Grace Lutheran has been about that. Already when we moved to this location, it was with a kindergarten in place, gathering little children to the Savior. Further still, by setting this example, Jesus did not mean that the Holy Christian Church should only reach out to children, but rather he was teaching that a child's faith is the standard or model that we all aspire to. In the end, that's a takeaway point also. Little children have faith in their parents and grandparents, right? And putting aside worldly cares and going forward with such faith, we begin to learn how to believe like God's people. It really is true. Uh, the best thing I have ever done in my entire pastoral career was to sign up to teach first grade religion. Every time I walk into that classroom, I see this type of faith in action. That is a family. They care about one another. They help one another. They aren't perfect at it. They fumble at it. But the sincere love and concern shines through. Better yet, though, I saw that faith in action this past week when one of our own kids, just like I told you before, a high school student, a Grace grad, active member of our music ministry, was involved in that horrific accident while driving home. He was struck by a driver in a stolen car. 
who was weaving in and out of heavy traffic trying to escape. Charlie's truck was completely overturned. And when Nicole and I got over there, the scene looked grim. In fact, one of our other former Wildcats saw that scene moments after it happened. That's how we found out about it. He called his mom another grace teacher. Meanwhile, Charlie was trapped in his truck. And his mom and his dad were at a conference on the other side of the state. In that moment, the entire Grace community sprang into action. Some, as I told you, went to the scene, then to the hospital. Some made sure that his brother, who is a student here, was safe. Others, that the rest of the scholars were informed and comforted and assured that he'd be cared for by the best medical professionals. All of us prayed. At the hospital, people began to arrive. And the people of God at Grace assembled there. We had almost as many of us there in that OR waiting room as we have here in church tonight. It was like a service. All to help the family out until mom and dad could arrive. I was in awe of how you could see and sense the connection that we had one to another, brothers and sisters in Christ. And as word came to us about Charlie's condition and how he had made it through surgery and was expected to, to recover, we all knew that the hand of God was at work to protect this child. Can you imagine, too, that his mom and dad showed up at the airport with no ticket, needing to get on a flight to get back home, and less than an hour later, they were in the air heading here. We can't even do that when we've had tickets for two months. It's a miracle. The next day, Charlie's mom softly said to me, we'd do this for any Grace kid, wouldn't we? All of you here tonight need to know that we would for anyone from greatest to least, because while we're not perfect, while we're still sinners, the love of Christ compels us no more than that. The love of Christ propels us into action, all of which shouts out love for neighbor when everything around us seeks to shut us down. The gospel for this evening recalls how the Lord Jesus sprang into action by coming down off the Mount of Transfiguration and heading to the cross of his death. In God's kingdom, everything is reversed. Of course it is. If the world is broken, then his kingdom must operate in a radically different way from what our senses observe. Therefore, in God's kingdom, the leaders serve. The weak are made strong, and the strongest of all, God the Son dies that others may live. And then, after three days of being shut down, the Father raised him back to life so that he might be there in a surgical waiting room, the great physician and healer of souls, and then come to grace this night to forgive your sins and feed your faith from his table. Praise be the holy name of Jesus forever. Amen.
Please stand now and join with me in praising our God's name in the words of the Nicene Creed. I. Please be seated for the prayer of the church. In our prayers this evening, uh, we include all of those who are listed on our prayer page. Uh, we do also add Barbara and Randy, for whom prayers have been requested. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you have taken us from all nations and united us in the body of your Son. Send your Holy Spirit to rid your children of all bitter jealousy, boasting, and selfish ambition. Fill the baptized with your wisdom that we may lead peaceable lives with sincerity. Move those set in positions of authority to act according to your will and ways. And send your spirit of discernment upon the electorate in the upcoming election particularly those who will go to the polls in Delaware, Hawaii, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Iowa, and Indiana in the coming weeks. Lord, in your mercy, O Lord of hosts, give our synod's leaders and all pastors the wisdom that comes down from above that they may be peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Let them sow among us in peace and grant a harvest of righteousness. Watch over all pastors, deaconesses, DCEs, and educators of the Florida-Georgia district as we travel to and from our conferences in this upcoming week. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your loving kindness, you do not abandon your children to suffer alone, but promise to care for all who call upon your name. Bless the homebound, the lonely and depressed and anxious, those preparing for surgery, the ill and the dying, especially those who desire our prayers, including Barbara, Randy, Beverly, Carol, Sue, Charlie, Linda, Charlene, and all first responders, members of the military, and our allies spread throughout the world, especially in Israel. Comfort all in their distress, heal all their ills of body and soul, and grant to them your peace. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord of hosts, your son was cut off from the land of the living on the tree of the cross, that we might eat and drink the fruit of his body and blood and live forever. Grant that we may worthily receive his supper in remembrance of him. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
At this time, we wish the Lord's blessing to those who have been watching us online. Uh, we also have our slide up reminding us about the offering, and our offering plates are up front. We thank you for participating uh, in the ministry of grace in this way. Please stand. <laughs> 